very much to our wonderful MCs of the day. And as a manager, I'm, I'm familiar with um, delegation, so I'm actually going to delegate introductions to everybody on the panel. But um, first, uh, uh, just intro myself. So um, I work for Samsung Internet. Uh, I lead the developer advocacy team. I also co-chair something called the W3C TAG, Technical Architecture Group, and I'm on the Mozilla or uh, MDN uh, Product Advisory Board um, as well. So I had, I'm very, really honored to be able to be part of this event today. Just by, um, by way of introduction, um, or by way of setting the scene, um, this morning, Henri talked about collaboration. I really, I really like that. Um, he also talked about respect. Um, I like to say the web is agreement. Uh, you can't really have agreement without collaboration and respect. Uh, so uh, last week um, in Japan, we had the W3C TPAC meeting. Many people w were, who I see here were also at TPAC. Um, it's a, but for those of you who weren't or don't know what it is, it's a big yearly multi-group meeting that W3C runs, um, in which people come together from across uh, different uh, stakeholders of the web, including browsers, people who work for big companies, individual contributors, web developers, et cetera. Um, everyone there was there to collaborate. Uh, Kadir from MDN actually presented some of the preliminary results from the MDM developer needs assessment. Um, amongst other really valuable insights, uh, those results highlighted the importance of interoperability, interoperability between browsers. Um, that led to a lot of discussions about interop and how important that is uh, for the web and for, uh, for to work across browsers. Um, in the W3C tag, we also recently published something called the Ethical Web Principles. Anybody hear of it? A couple of hands. Okay, great. <laughs> um, one of those Ethical Web Principles is that the web is multi-browser, multi-device, multi-OS. Uh, so, uh, today, we're going to try and channel some of that energy, some of that collaboration, some of that passion for collaboration into today's panel, um, where we're going to be talking about the future of the web browser, uh, the future uh, different visions we hold and the priorities we all have. Uh, we're going to have a discussion up here, but we have limited time, so you should think about this as the beginning of a conversation. You should come find us, find us in the breaks, find us over lunch. Um, come. Uh, finish the discussions that we're going to start up here. Um, with that, I'm going to shut up, I promise, um, and uh, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and tell us um, what they're working on and what they're excited about bringing to the web. Awesome. Uh, so you might have seen me talk like a little bit ago, but uh, I'm Melanie Richards. I'm on the Microsoft Edge web platform team. Uh, the cool thing about the web is that there's like so much to explore and I've actually done like quite a few things on the Edge team. I originally joined as a designer developer working on developer experiences. Um, so more recently I've been working as a PM um, on the web platform directly, uh, working on um, accessibility projects um, such as high contrast, um, bringing UI automation to um, the open source projects. Um, things like that. And uh, very, very recently we'll be joining some of my colleagues working on um, privacy projects. So, um, you know, I did just talk about high contrast, but I am actually really excited about it. Um, so we've actually wanted to standardize those techniques for a while, and moving to open source for our rendering engine has provided us a really excellent excuse to, like, get that started, that conversation started again. Um, so we're really happy to see that moving into the standards body, so. <coughs> All right, um, so my name is Kenji. I'm actually French. I have a Japanese name. It's a very long story. Um, it explains a lot of like what I've been ended up doing, which is I actually live in Japan. I used to work for um, a very like traditional Japanese company called Sharp Electronics, and so I was building like smartphones, um, things that uh, we were hoping that Nintendo would use. And then uh, for some odd reasons, um, I moved on to uh, Google and my main focus has been on um, loading, making things load fast. And um, I think from now on, I'm going to, to say that uh, I care about making connections go gangster. That's a better way of like framing what I do. <laughs> um, and so lately I've been working on web packaging and portals, uh, which are uh, APIs that we hope can, can make those like connection, uh, even if they're not gangster, make, make them look like they are. Uh, so that's what I've been doing. Hi, I'm Dees Chinya. I'm actually South African, but I'm based in London. My wife is Dutch, so there's a connection there. My kids are English and confused. And I'm generally a troublemaker. 
Um, I've spent the longest time, or almost two decades, in dot com world. Uh, usual suspects: eBay, PayPal, BBC, uh, and then spent the longest time at Mozilla and Firefox from Firefox 3.8. So starting at Mozilla Labs, when we were about 100 people. Uh, I've only left Mozilla about a year ago, uh, but I'm still closely uh, involved with the web. Today, I'm an uh, individual advisor for early stage startups and technology startups. But the thing that keeps me close to the web uh, is working on a new standard called web monetization uh, alongside a protocol called Interledger. And that's hoping to make um, content creators better remunerated on the web as opposed to some of the traditional methods that are in front of them today, which are ad networks, subscriptions, paywalls, taking your data and selling it on. Uh, so that's the stuff that's, that's keeping me super excited. And uh, in the last 10 days or so, we announced a $100 million grant. There's a lot of zeros there. Uh, in collaboration, that word again, uh, with Creative Commons and with Mozilla. And we're hoping to bring other not-for-profits into bo into, on board. And we'll be distributing this money uh, to content creators out there. So web developers are a good early audience, but think uh, wider field. Hey, everybody. My name is uh, Ahmed Nasri. I am from Toronto, Canada originally from Damascus, Syria, and my wife is actually from South Africa, so there's a completely irrelevant yeah. connection for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm the CTO of NPM. I'm uh, super excited about the supply chain and the sustainability of it. Uh, the thing that I'm most interested in is how do we facilitate access to developers all around the world. So topics like performance and documentation, as Andre was talking about this morning, are very interesting to me, and it's a personal passion of mine to uh, give the developer experience growth and access for folks not just speaking English or North American countries or Western countries, uh, but all around the world because the, the experiences that we all are creating here are shared experiences for the rest of our colleagues all around the world and we should be able to reach out and learn from them as much as we can. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Andreas Bovens. Uh, I work at Mozilla. Uh, there's actually talking about connections. I used to live in Japan for many years. Um, and then I lived in Norway where I worked for another browser vendor. Um, and so since two years I live in London. Uh, I work for Mozilla. I am platform lead. I lead a team of um, amazing product managers that focus on all things Gecko. Gecko is the rendering engine at the heart of Firefox. Um, and so we have people working on runtime, uh, uh, rendering, uh, add-ons, dev tools. Um, new form factors, things like VR browsers and things like that. Um, so very excited to be here. Um, and one of the, the things I'm really passionate about and I've been focusing a lot over the last uh, two years or so is uh, a project called Gecko View. Um, Gecko View, you can think of it as the, the Gecko engine, but repackaged or packaged um, for use as a, as, an, as a component in Android applications. So if you build a browser, or if you build an application that somehow needs a web engine, you can plug in Gecko View. Um, and so we're, we're trying to make it really easy to use uh, for other folks to, to build browsers with. Uh, and of course, also for ourselves. We've been rethinking our mobile products, our mobile browser, um, and also we've been working on a VR browser. All of those um, are powered by Gecko View. And so, yeah, this is um, something I'm really excited about. Hi everyone, I'm Hee Jin Chung from Samsung and uh, I am working on Samsung internet development for like web engine features maybe uh, and I have been working on browsers for about eight, nine years all at Samsung. <laughs> so my life is like less exciting than all of yours anyways. And so recently we have been working on progressive web apps and web payments and it's really important for Samsung because we produce like various devices with various OSs on them and web is very, I mean, the platform that we can rely on to provide interoperability and consistency to our users. So that's what I'm most excited about right now. For, for, for my, uh, <laughs> for, for my part, I'm uh, from the U.S., but I live in London, so I have the privilege of being part of two wonderful countries. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
The, uh, uh, Adrian, you mentioned progressive web apps. I think that's one, in some discussions prior to the panel, that's one thing that we all really t touched on. Um, is there anything, do you want to talk about Web APK a uh, bit, or sure. is that something so, that you, um, yeah, I've been working on? Like uh, maybe March, begin, starting from March, we started supporting Web APKs in our Android, uh, Android browser, and it's just, uh, it lets users install PWAs as native apps on Android phones. And it's, uh, I think it helps in increasing engagement to the web contents and you know, lets users like uh, manage their privacy settings more easily. But one uh, unfortunate thing that we had to like uh, manage what manage with was that it, we had to rely on the store, I mean App Store, to make that happen. So we only support uh, web, AK, web APKs on Galaxy phones with Android N and above. Uh, I hope we somehow find a way to expand it to all Android uh, phones. And another thing we're working on these days is trying to find a way to make more, uh, web, make PWAs more discoverable. So inside Samsung, we're working with other teams to see where we can like show more, uh, suggest more web apps to users. And well, it's pretty difficult because in the open web, it's like given that we can just uh, link to other websites, but in stores there are like, um, what the, what, uh, so we need consent from the author or something and we need to get right. consent for like us using their logos. So we're trying to figure out what the best part, right. I mean, what, what the best way is for so that. These, you mentioned web gaming to me and web game seems to be another area that has similar challenges to, um, or, or that's overlapping with the kind of progressive web app story. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think web games or HTML5 games is a, is a really good use case for, for progressive web apps as such. Um, you know, we, I played a, a, a big part many years ago in, in trying to deprecate Flash from, from the web. Uh, so think back to <laughs> Uh, mscripten and what's now WebAssembly, et cetera. Um, so th the thing that, that strikes me though is that the technical challenges will, will catch up to native, right? Which is why a lot of the game developers move to the native platforms. Uh, and, and, and we will share, solve things like, you know, shared array buffers and threading and all of those things that the gamers care about. I can see Kashper somewhere in the, in, from Pokey going on to me about that. Uh, but the thing that was still around maybe three or four years ago that people, game developers asked, indie game developers asked for, was two things, discoverability and monetization. And up to today, those two things are still not solved. And their kickback to me was someone like, well, you talk about the web, right? Like, you have all these great search engines, but I still can't get my game discovered. Um, and so on that front, you know, when I came away from the W3C web games workshop in Seattle a few months ago, uh, Tom Greenaway from the Chrome team uh, is certainly looking at discoverability for web games and trying to incorporate with some of the existing work with schema.org and those sorts of pieces. And then on the monetization effort, web monetization, uh, something I'm working on with the team at, at Coil and the Interledger community um, is something that we hope to, to help to solve for that. Uh, we're seeing some early uh, positive steps, let's say, uh, I think Andresh is here. Andresh is the founder of JS13K, uh, which ran for the last month or so. So that's indie web game developers trying to make a, a fully fledged game in under 13 kilobytes, which is pretty impressive in itself. Uh, but today, this, this last year, month, he introduced a new category called web monetization. Um, and somewhat even to me, surprisingly, we've had over 50 entries in web monetization category. Uh, and they are super interesting games. And as I'm playing these games, I'm actually streaming money to these content owners and developers in real time. Uh, you know, game developers tell me that, you know, I put my games out, I hope to make some money. Uh, maybe in six months I get a check for 50 cents. I don't even know if that check's going to come. Um, 
you know, he did this on a weekend with one of his games, and uh, you know, he, he I am me the, the weekend after, and says like, I've already got money in my account, and I think that's that's amazing, right? The enthusiasm is there. Any other thoughts around monetization? I'm really excited to. Oh. No, not this one. Uh, I'm really excited to see this kind of evolve as well. I'm like um, thinking about publishing, right? You know, you get these like huge paywalls. Um, you know, it's uh, there, there's like can be a high barrier to entry um, to engage with content, and so you see that like um, I don't know web monetization, micropayments can make it easy to say, okay, I want to read this specific article from here, or this one from over here, and um, you can see how like. This could lead to, you know, better privacy-preserving um, ways of making money on the web. You know, because today the model that we have, um, to me personally, feels like it's not totally working for everybody. Like all this um, cash is flowing through like the ad business, um, and so it'd be like really cool to find other ways to support creators on the web. Um, in ways that are open and transparent and people, um, I think individuals feel really good actually about saying like, I love your content, like here, like I want to support you. So um, yeah, yeah I'm excited about creators, this. Creators, when they, when they make their content, uh, they, you know, if they can make some money, like today their only choices are an uh, ad network or mm -hmm. subscription or paywall. Uh, we have to give them more choices. And so things like Patreon and Brave and the stuff we're doing with Coil and web monetization start putting more choices in there. It's um, exciting to see a lot of innovation happening in that space as well. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah at, at Mozilla, um, we also see this, this problem with you know uh, ads everywhere and, and users don't like ads. Uh, there's all this pervasive tracking and so on. So we put in tracking protection um, but you also see like the, the, whole, the whole model of um, sort of ad-based uh, or ad-supported content is, you know, there's still probably a place for it, but there's, it's also, there's also seems to be room for something else. Um, so and this, the, this, the partnership with, um, with Coil was already uh, mentioned earlier, but Mozilla has also been experimenting uh, with a partnership with Scroll, um, whereby uh, we're trying to find alternative ways to sort of do uh, do payments uh, or like micro payments on the web um, and, and, and you know where users um, give small uh, uh, well uh, sign up for a, a sort of subscription and then they get access to, to pieces of content that otherwise would be ad supported uh, so these are some of the things we're experimenting with but it's, it's also a problem uh, Mozilla is very keen on, on solving or helping to solve um, one thing I've noticed is um, <coughs> So the first time I, when I was in Japan, it was the whole I mode like uh, uh, Fury, um, and sure it's like a wall garden, right? But if you look at it, um, essentially it was made of two things. It was made of like web-like content. It was a subset of HTML. I don't think they had JavaScript, um, so it was very simple. But it, it worked really well in terms of user experience for the device that you had at the time. And then for the more interactive uh, experience, it was based on Java. Um, at the very end, I think they even like had Flash, which was a big mistake <laughs> in my book. Um, but the, the good thing they, they got going was the payment, the, the, the way people would like um, browse and like discover interesting things, whether it's like content or games. Uh, so they got the discovery going on, but also the payment. It was integrated with the, uh, your uh, like mobile connection provider. And at least in Japan, it worked pretty well. Like people did pay for things. And so there was no, as far as I'm, I, I remember, a lot of like ad like supported um, things. So it's not like the web is not meant to work with these things. There, there are things we could do better. Um, and um, on discovery, it's not just for web games. Like we hear from partners that they care a lot about discovery, especially on mobile. Because unlike desktop and laptops, like people when they use their mobile device, they want to be entertained most of the time. It's very rare when they have something in mind and they are going to search for it and like find it. It's more kind of like um, a passive user experience. I think there is more things we could do there as well. Yeah, we're, we're trying to create something where it's, it's organic, right? You should just continue surfing the web as you normally do and not think, oh, I should go to this site or that site. Uh, and as you're doing it, because you want to support content creators, this automatically happens in the background. So today, that works uh, with, with our service. Uh, with something that's built in with the browser extensions. 
Uh, but hopefully, working on the standard, this just becomes default and baked into the browsers. And then you don't have to think, I want to give this creator 50 cents or that article two cents. Mm -hmm. It's just happening in real time. And I mean, you know, when we've got people that, that probably a lot of you know out there in, in the audience, you know, uh, whether that's Chris Coyo over at CSS Tricks and, and, and David Walsh blog, um, and a number of others that are already playing around and experimenting with this, I think that becomes really interesting. Uh, and you're not thinking, right? You just hit a site and suddenly you're sending them a few pennies, but that adds up. It's interesting because I think in the early days of the web, um, when I was first doing web... Uh, Can you talk about widgets again? Sorry, no. <laughs> this is way back before then. I mean, we're talking like, oh... Bruce is here. You tables. Can talk about widgets with him. Tables are new, you know, that kind of thing, that uh, kind of era. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, we really thought like micropayments was going to be like a key part of the web, and it never really happened. Um, so it's interesting to see, you know, new, uh, new initiatives around that. I think just to tease the privacy aspect a little bit more. Um, it's also we've been seeing a lot happen with. Um, innovation around privacy, and I, Melanie, you, you are doing some stuff around privacy, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about, about that, er, that aspect. Um, do you? Awesome. Yeah. yeah, so um, we're really excited actually to see like really how much activity there is in the standards bodies today around privacy. Like so many of us coming together with like, here's an idea, here's another idea, what if we did it this way? And I think this is like a really interesting batch of problems that will require like all of our, all of our creativity, you know, collectively to address. Um, so I think, you know, we're kind of early in our journey, um, really thinking about privacy and, and how to address these issues on the web. And I think um, first we kind of wanted to come at it, like before we start really deep diving in the technical solutions, um, we wanted to start by just understanding like what is the promise that we're making to our users. And so we feel like it's going to take a while to work through all these things, and so we need to like self-police a little bit. Um, and so uh, internally, we're kind of framing this as like a Hippocratic oath. You know, it's like what are what are we promising, folks? You know, and the pillars of this oath are um, transparency. So we want to make sure under users understand what's happening. Um, we want control. So put the users in control of you know um, uh, any privacy-preserving techniques. Uh, we want to respect the user and their choices, and we want to protect their um, important data. So uh, one of the first projects that you know we've been working on um, in this pri privacy preserving space is um, uh, tracking prevention. So um, we kind of have this like balanced view on by default in uh, preview versions of Microsoft Edge today um, that will you know block storage access um, from you know certain uh, types of trackers, and uh, it will uh, block. Um, resource requests from other trackers from allowing them to, uh, you know, get access to your data. And then there's also, like, more strict, um, you know, uh, settings that you can use. So uh, we're also looking at, you know, some of the new proposals that are coming out. We're starting to work on the storage access API within the open source projects. And uh, we're really excited to partner with everybody on this. So, uh, Ahmed, um, you, in our discussions, you mentioned to me uh, something which I really, it wasn't on my radar, which was like about how uh, dependencies can sometimes impact privacy be because of uh, code modules. Is that something you can talk to? Yeah, absolutely. As we're heading into a world where <clears throat> the, the modern web facilitates for, you know, fast loading of modules or packages or hyperlinking to something and actually using a widget that's embedded in your website, not that kind of widget. Um, yeah. But like the modern web is all about web components, all about reuse, it's all about sharing. You know, so we have a developer economy where you know you you build a you know a widget or a component of some sort, um, and it's used by hundreds of thousands of people, if not billions of people, if it gets not notoriety, or maybe it's embedded as part of a product that you're also reselling and other people are using. Um, so like the the network effect of that, and by that what I mean is the actual network, like. The, the, the URL and the web around it, um, the model of security there doesn't translate very well. If you're, if you're loading things remotely and or you're doing things on the fly, um, we, we talk a lot about privacy and, and access controls and uh, you know, levels of user interaction that deal with the domain that you're on, but when you're doing things externally and trying to bring in context, maybe you've allowed a credit card level access to a domain 
uh, that was using a widget from a third party, but now you're on this other domain that's malicious, it happens to use that same widget, uh, you know, maybe you've implicitly allowed that permission to transfer through. So there's all these complexity layers that we have to start thinking about where we as developers are using third party tools or packages uh, or services for that matter. Um, so it's not enough to think and worry about our own kind of user experience using the, the, the business logic that we created. It's also when you adopt and use libraries or tools or packages or, you know, third party content, uh, how does that translate? You know, a big pattern today is using um, you know, services like Unpackage or CDNJS or others just to bring in some CSS. And we've seen, I think, recently where even, even CSS can be used to maliciously attack the target website that the visitor is on, right? Um, so thinking of that experience as a developer is a, is a thing we don't talk about enough. Is there more browsers need to do to help protect users um, when, you know, uh, from, from those types of attacks? Is there more that, that, that we could be doing on the, uh, on the browser side? I'm looking at browsers. I would look at my colleagues who work at browser <laughs> companies ask that question. Temple Internet has been providing, uh, well, ad blockers and tracking blockers, third party tracking blockers as an extension framework for a few years till now. And uh, early this year, we started uh, working on a feature called smart anti-tracking that we use on-device machine learning to figure out if this third-party domain is trying to track you. And um, I think users are, we're, tr we're, we're also trying to educate users what that means to them. And we recently saw that users are actually turning it on more and more. So I'm happy to see that trend. and. We hope to like enhance actually the machine learning part and add more features to protect the user's security and privacy more. Yeah, also in um, Firefox, uh, we're shipping tracking protection. In recent versions, it's, it's turned on by default, actually. So we track a number of, um, so we, uh, we block a number of trackers. Um, and uh, also um, uh, cryptocurrency miners crypto miners uh, by default. And so you can, the user has a choice between the default settings or the, the strict settings, will also, which also block fingerprinters. So we're experimenting with on mobile to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, we feel there, there is um, the problem if, if you block a lot, content might break. Uh, and so this is like a delicate balance. You have to balance site compatibility and, and user expectations there with providing ac adequate um, uh, privacy protections, and so this this balance is often tricky. We feel there's a little bit more leeway, perhaps, on mobile. We we see there that it, it is it is possible there to uh, ramp up the settings a bit and provide even more protection. Um, and so uh, we also recently, uh, oh, we're working on a. Um, uh, as Melanie also said, like it's it's important to show to users what is going on or what we're doing for them. So there's now an about protections page where you can see how many trackers have been blocked um, and, and you know, uh, users can actually understand what's going on under the hood, so it's, uh, yeah. I yeah. think there's, um, you, you mentioned the keyword machine learning. I think there's definitely a lot of opportunities there because, you know, the, the, the level of supply chain attacks that, you know, we see at NPM um, and, you know, we have many examples where, where in the past we had to intervene and or take things off. Uh, it's different when it's on the web, right? Like it's, it's when it's in your node modules and we take things offline because they were malicious or maybe a user decided to take off their package, you know, like the left pad incident. Um, it does affect millions of developers, but it doesn't affect the users, right? It affects the developers who are relying on, you know, the tools and the packages. But what's on the web, it's already distributed and there's so many layers of caches, and so many layers of whether it's network level cache or, you know, the edge caching that we all have and, and you know, distributed nature of the web doesn't facilitate for that. But I think that's where things like machine learning are a good opportunity for us to um, kind of tackle it from both ends. Like even if something is detected and removed from the source, uh, at, you know, at some point it's distributed already. So how do you capture it from the other side, from the user side? Uh, maybe that's an operating system level, maybe it's a browser level, I don't know. Um, but it's interesting to me to, to start thinking about those models because, you know, there's only so much we can do, for example, in taking something that's malicious off a registry. Uh, off you, and as a developer, your responsibility is now removed, but then how do you translate that back to the user? Yeah. I think generally, like, privacy is hard, right? Privacy and security is hard. 
Yeah. Uh, that, that's why we get involved in it, right? It's, if it was, you know, if we just want to get a, around it, we could do lots of cool stuff very quickly. I mean, even um, Uncle Bruce, he's somewhere here, Bruce Lawson joined me a few months ago, and the first thing he did was, like, rewrite the privacy policy 101 times uh, because it is hard, right? It's easy to forget about these things. Uh, but even as we were playing around, I think Stefan's here, we found an interesting side effect with web monetization that it even kicks in in incognito mode, right? Which means that you could be in incognito mode but still giving back to content creators that you that you respect. Sure, because of the anonymous aspect of it, yep. right? Yeah, okay. The, um, we may want to shift tracks to talk a little bit about, coming back to the progressive web apps story, um, and maybe a little bit about APIs and bringing new APIs to the web. Is that something that, uh, that we can um, shift to a little bit? I mean, one of the, um, one of the interesting things that I've seen is that just that we've never been in a kind of more active time when it comes to new stuff that's coming to the web platform, right? And I guess coming back to what I was saying earlier about TPAC last uh, couple weeks ago, um, what, you know, kind of new APIs are, are we looking at or are we excited about maybe? Um, you know, who would like to start off? Maybe Kenji? Uh, so I think it was at TPAC. Um, is this API, I'm not sure about the, um, the latest name. I think it's called something like storage boxes or storage um, blocks. Anyway, I think the, the idea is that um, today when you want to use the cache storage for your PWA, um, there is no kind of like way for, for you as a developer to say, I'm putting a bunch of data here, but it's totally optional. Like if you run out of storage, you can get rid of it. But this set is super important. Like, uh, if you want to get rid of it, maybe it's better for you to ask me so I can tell the user that something is going on. And the reason I care about this one is that um, when we talk to users in markets like India, um, they, a lot of users are getting online for the first time, and they can like, afford a very low-end device. And you, if you look at the spec, it's like, um, if you're lucky, you can get three, four gigabytes of RAM. It's actually pretty cheap. Um, the CPU you get is like not great. <laughs> and then the storage you get is like eight gig. Um, obviously you can, you can use the micro SD uh, slot to, to get more, but you end up in the situation where people don't have like a laptop and whatnot, and so they are like managing the storage. And if you think about um, the PWA, PWA actually has a great story because it can be as small as it needs to be, uh, except that we don't really know as a browser what can we get rid of? What is important to user? What is not? Yeah. And so those kind of API are actually super exciting for this particular use case. Yeah. Uh, you, one of the stories you told me, Ahmed, about, the, about your uh, experiences on the internet kind of resonate with, with that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it comes back to a lot of topics we talked about already, but like um, I shared the story of like my first time getting online was through when I was still in Syria living in Damascus and I had to uh, do a long distance dial up to the country next door so I can access the internet on a dial up connection because it was illegal for where I, where I was from and at the time. Um, and I had to do it in the middle of the night, you know, behind closed doors because if they arrest you, you're going to go to jail. Um, so, you know, dial up internet, long distance, uh, hand, hand me down laptop from my cousins in the US who came to visit. Uh, that's how I got online. And even though that's shifted and changed, you know, over the years, uh, still, the limitations of developing countries, as you said, whether it's in devices, portable or otherwise, um, are still there, whether it's a privacy concern, because back there, it's not about so much the browser and what you, you know, block from a website, it's about your ISP tracking you and your government want to know everything you're doing. Um, or, you know, monetization option as well, because uh, credit cards are not a thing. Um, people do money transfers through cell phone and SMS uh, communication, right? So when we talk about these kind of opportunities and things that we're developing the web platform for, uh, we're leaving a big portion of you know humanity and people behind. But over time, they either they're they're the ones catching up. We're not going in and trying to lean in and helping you know be where they are. And to your point, uh, whether it's like new APIs and the platforms to better detect and, and you know adapt to the environment, uh, or creating opportunities where where none exist, right? So. Um, like performance is a big thing, and a, a, a thing that I carried with me over the years, even though now I live in Toronto and I have a high-speed internet, is if a website, a website doesn't load fast enough, I'm not using it, period, because 
back in the dial-up days, uh, I only had a limited amount of time before the cops gonna come, come on the door. So I just needed to get out of line, do the thing I needed to do and get out. Uh, but that's still a pattern of behavior I do today. And honestly, that's a good and better experience for everybody regardless. Like performance is a key differentiator. Uh, but especially for these developing countries and the world around. It's interesting that when Twitter uh, launched their uh, Twitter Lite progressive web app, and that's, I use that exclusively now uh, for all Twitter stuff on, on um, they uh, launched it as uh, um, as Twitter Lite, you know, address it with with specific features that address developing um, countries and low bandwidth needs. So yeah, yeah. Um, maybe something about progressive web apps uh, in Firefox as well. We're currently building um, a new um, Firefox browser for Android. It's currently called Firefox Preview, but that's not the final name. Eventually, it will replace the the current Firefox in the in the App Store, um, and so. We have the luxury there to kind of re-implement everything, and so we're also rethinking how we implement progressive web apps. So we're working on bringing that back to the to the browser in the early versions that are out now. It's not uh, it's not supported yet, but so uh, manifest support, so installation support, and so on is coming soon. Um, push notifications as well, so they are landing soon, and we're looking there again at um, doing something with badging, kind of um, surfacing to the user that something is installable without getting too much in their way. Uh, because we see that um, uh, users do find it more comfortable sometimes to, or they, they, they feel more confident that the progressive web app is what they need rather than the native app. They don't need all the, the bells and whistles of the, of the native app. They're just fine, as you say, with mm. the, the, the sort of uh, slim down experience perhaps or kind of more the faster experience or the experience where they can control the permissions because they feel, okay, the browser has my back uh, and, and I don't have to give away all my, uh, you know, uh, private data or, or whatever, uh, all kinds of permissions, uh, and, and that, that native apps have, um, and so I can I can better control the the experience. I like a, um, the browser has my back. That, yeah. that could be a good. Exactly, um, it's a user agent, right? So yeah. you have to act on the you know on the user's behalf. Um, I like so, that spam. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned notifications. Uh, which brings to mind the topic of permissions. We have a few more minutes left, so do, do we want to talk about permissions uh, notifications? Uh, I, mm? I can say something about that. Um, so we've, we've seen that, uh, as you've all seen, actually, let me, let me go back uh, three years ago. I was on this stage. Uh, not, talking not, about not, the, too, not too no, long, because no, no. we want to hear from I'll, the I'll be very short. Too. I was okay. standing on the stage talking about progressive web apps, and then at that time, notifications, web notifications were something new. And we're saying, yeah, you should try this out because it will allow you to reach users and they don't have to subscribe to your, um, to your mailing list. You can just send them a push notifications. And now, as we know, you know, when you go on the mobile web, you're sort of bombarded with uh, requests to like, please accept our push notifications. So we're bringing in more controls to kind of limit this, um, to allow users to turn off requests for push notifications or else to kind of do it in a more subtle way so you don't have to deal with a pop-up, but you just see something happening, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a soft uh, wiggle of an icon or something like that, sort of say, hey, the site wants to send you push notifications, but please continue browsing. Um, yeah. Do, do, do you so, so it's al always difficult to, like, inform users, but not annoy them. So I think a lot of designers in our team are also, like, trying to figure out what's the best way to do that. Yeah. I think that's why um, user control is like a very important tenant because um, you know every person will have different preferences about like when they want to be notified, how they want to be notified, and what kind of information they want. So there's like two main problems, which is like permission fatigue, like you just th see these things everywhere. And then also the lifetime of a permission, right? You know, it's like just because I am fine with you having this permission now while I'm like trying to get this very specific thing done doesn't mean I'm okay with you having it like two weeks from now. So those are two like very important things that we're you know trying to think through. We're, you know we're thinking like can we extend um, the APIs to kind of have the user control um, you know time limits for these permissions like okay you can have this for an hour so I can just get in and out of this experience or you can have it for a week because I come here every day or something like that. So I think that'll be interesting. And I like the idea of actually, you know, kind of paring back the UI a little bit in certain cases um, because it's still there. The user, you know, can know that they have, you know, something going on, but it's not like right in their face. So I think that's a really cool experiment. Yeah, first one on that. Um, um, 
at just some point we, we are like hoping by having this like UX more in your face, like a model dialog, like developer would not do it, but actually to keep doing it. <laughs> and so I think um, there is some, some incentive problem on the web where um, you can get away with like annoying user experience. Like there is nothing, um, like user would just keep coming back because uh, maybe they would like search for something and you get on search page and they forget about the bad user experience they got last time. And I, I think there is a set of things we could do better here. Trying to incentivize, there are developers who like really care about it and like only prompt when it's needed. And I think we should reward those kind of user experience and find ways to, to get more of those on the web. I think by default limiting um, the sort of making sure that the user doesn't give away too much, as you say, like a, a you know, an ex expiry after a certain time or just default to like once but not always and make them do more effort to say allow permissions, uh, allow um, notifications to come through permanently or something like this is, you know. I think uh, yeah. Also we've seen a lot of examples of websites malicious websites mm -hmm. ga gaming the user experience or socially manipulating the user. What was the one that I saw recently where some, the, there was a graphic of uh, uh, some friendly looking, you know, cartoon character pointing up towards the notification prompt saying, prove you're not a robot by clicking OK, yeah. right? Uh, <laughs> just yeah. diabolical, absolutely Jeez. diabolical manipulation of the user because users are used to like, prove you're not a robot things. You know, they just, they don't see them anymore. So uh, it's something I think we need to pay attention to. In the last three minutes, maybe we want to kind of like, um, what's the, go down the road, you know, like what's, what's the, what's the, I don't know, what, what do you want to fix on the web? What's the, uh, what's the web, be, web we want kind of, uh, you know, uh, closing statement? That's a tall order, huh? <laughs> well, um, it doesn't need to be everything, but just one thing, you know? Yeah, you know, so I think um, I feel very lucky to have been able to work on the intersection of, like, technology and human rights on the web. You know, it's like accessibility, privacy. These are, like, fundamental um, things that we should all enjoy and, and not have to give up. And so, um, you know, as we kind of head into thinking more about, like, how can we preserve privacy on the web, I think, like, one really interesting question is, like, what do we do about fingerprinting? You know, so there's all these APIs that allow us to do, like, really cool stuff on the web, but they also allow you to kind of covertly, you know, create um, a profile of a person and track them without them knowing, you know, so they're blocking cookies or something. Um, so I think, like, Figuring out that is going to be very interesting, and I'm looking forward to openly collaborating on standards with the rest of the folks. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, for me, it's mostly about figuring out like the discovery issue that people have been mentioning. I think that there is a lot of opportunity for us to reward uh, great user experience, finding ways to get uh, users to discover what is good about the web. Um, so, more work on that, especially trying to to close the gap that we have. I feel between what sort of ex user experience you can get from a native app uh, in terms of like discovery and what you get on the web today where it's still a lot of like hard work and you can feel that it's still very much like a page driven user in, uh, experience. You can, you can see things loading and the web has this like breadth of content and if we could make discovery like seamless, um, great user experience end to end, uh, people would come to realize what the web has to offer over the native and world garden that people use today. So. I'm going to be slightly selfish and say let's let's fix monetization on the web or, or have a go at it. Like many Shut people shame. have tried <laughs> uh, many times before. Um, you know, we have this opportunity now. You're all content creators out there, uh, so I'd encourage you to go check out the web monetization work. Uh, it's a simple meta tag that you can insert into your URLs. Uh, it is literally one line. Um, we have this thing to incentivize you called Grant for the Web. Um, it's $100 billion. It's not, it's pocket change compared to what the Amazons and the Netflixes of the world spend on their content ecosystem. But it's a starting point to catalyze uh, the web monetized web and content that can be web monetized on the web. So go out and do it. And um, I think it's going to be interesting times. Um, my one thing I want to see for the web is a more inclusive web for all developers all around the world. Um, that, you know, I think we're missing a lot of experiences that we are definitely aware of, but are not being represented in these kind of conversations, in these kind of dialogues. 
whether it's standards or APIs or you know better behaviors. Um, so I'd like to, I'd like us to see reach out, and that does not doesn't always mean you know other side of the world. <coughs> There's a lot of underrepresented points of view and or interactions from developers communities who are part of big enterprise businesses or you know folks who don't go out to conferences or are not part of a certain community. Uh, I think I want to see more of that representation and learn from it as much as share back to them. I'm back. Yes. Um, from my side, I think right now when you browse the mobile web, uh, you see a lot of broken things. Uh, they don't look visually very pleasing. There's too many pop-ups, too many prompts. Uh, I want to see that fixed while also still, you know, the, the whole privacy aspect preserving some way to, um, uh, you know, it ties into monetization as well, prov providing some privacy or providing some privacy preserving way of making money um, and, and making it all visually uh, pleasing. That is sort of my, you know, um, my goal. So for me, uh, I think, well, as Kenji mentioned, there are some people that only have web apps as their uh, options. So I am looking forward to making web apps more usable, like native apps. And also Melanie's talk before this um, panel was very interesting because as a browser developer, uh, it's sometimes difficult to balance between the user's needs and the content developer's intents. So like we also have a high contrast mode built in our engine, but it sometimes breaks websites. So uh, making these standards is really what we should work together on in the future. Great way to close up. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, we're all keen to get to lunch. We're two minutes over. Um, so I really want to ask you all to thank our members of the panel today, and uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.